Hi, my name is Matt at LSAT Lab, and today's lesson is on standard ordering games in the logic game section. About 28% of all logic games are standard ordering games, so it's a really common game type, one that's really important for you to master, one that can have varying degrees of difficulty. So some of these will be very easy, and some of them will be very, very hard. Now, the process that we're going to take when we're working on these is the same as for all logic games. These are more like the phases of play that we're going to go through. And so if you're ever unsure what you should be doing next, ask yourself, where are you in this process? Like the first thing that you want to do is read the scenario and the rules and make a determination on how to set up the game. What's the game board going to look like that's going to help you create hypotheticals and track the information? Then slowly and carefully, you want to notate the rules in a consistent manner using the same notation each and every time. Then you want to pause and look back through the rules Double check them, make sure that you have them correct, and look for connections between them that allow you to make inferences, things that must be true under every circumstance, no matter what, just based off of the rules. Then you move on to the questions. So let's practice this, starting with step one. Let's come up with a game board for the following game. And when you think you have one that's going to work, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So we're told that we have seven paintings. So we can put the a cast of characters down and the paintings will be arranged in a horizontal row of seven positions with the first position being closest to the entrance and the seventh position being furthest from the entrance. So this is um, an ordering game where we're putting the paintings in order from closest to furthest from the entrance, one through seven. Our game board is going to be a straightforward number line. Now that we have a game board, we can move on to notating the rules. See if you can find a way of depicting them in a way that is good for you. And then when you're ready to compare to what I'm going to put together, Hit play again. All right, welcome back. Now let's take a look at that first rule. The turner must be closer to the entrance than the whistler. We can put that in a relative rule, just like we learned with tree ordering games. There are some rules that are going to be relative in nature. And so this is one that builds a relative relationship between T and W and tells us that T is closer to the front than W. So the second rule tells us that R must be closer to the entrance than M with exactly one other painting between them. So we're going to have an R, and then another painting, and then an M, and that's going to, we're going to put a box around that to represent a block. So we know that we're going to have those players in that order somewhere on the number line. The third rule tells us that P and S must be next to each other. So we know that they're going to form a block, but we don't know the order of that block. We don't know whether P will precede S or whether S will precede P. And so we can put a little handle on that block and tell us that we can flip that block either direction. That's a reminder that that block can turn around. The last rule, if the V is not in the third position, it must be in the fourth position. We can just write that as a rule. It's an if-then rule. And we'll write if the V is not third, then it must be the case that the V is fourth. Now, it may not be obvious at the beginning, or maybe it is to some of you, but a rule that goes from negative to positive means that at least one of those two things has to happen. If one of them doesn't, then the other does. And so what that's telling us is that V must be either in the third position or the fourth position. There are many types of rules on a standard ordering game, but there are some big ones. The most common would be rules that are relative in nature, building a relative relationship between two players. We saw that in this game. A position rule that rules out a player from a particular position. A fixed rule, a rule that connects two players in the game board in a fixed block type relationship. So these tend to be either blocks or split blocks where you have a player or two players in between. And then conditional rules. If G is earlier than F, then F is earlier than H. Right? So this builds an if-then relationship between two pieces of information. In the game we just looked at, we have a relative rule, a fixed rule, and a conditional rule. We just don't have a position rule here. And now that we've notated the rules, it's time to look for inferences, things that must be true no matter what. Based on the first rule, we can infer a couple of things. We know that W cannot go first. We know that T cannot go seventh, right? But these position eliminations, if it's directly stated in the rule, I would highly recommend that you put it onto the game board. But the implied ones, the ones that come from the other rules, I would recommend that you don't take the time to write them all out onto the game board. Typically, if you have this many players, you're not going to make inferences about who goes where by ruling out all of the rest of the individuals. So rather than 
taking up 30 seconds to 60 seconds looking for all the places where certain players can't go. Like, for example, based on the second rule, we know that M cannot go either first or second, as well that R cannot go sixth or seventh, right? We could probably do this for a while. For example, since we know that V has to go either third or fourth, we could rule out V from first, second, fifth, sixth, and seventh. It's probably not in our interest to do that. So this game, it's light on concrete inferences. There's There are implications to the rules but nothing to necessarily put into the game board before we start the questions. And that's our next step. So this is a rules question. And rules questions are best attempted by taking the rules one at a time and ruling out the wrong answers. So rather than taking answer choice by answer choice and comparing A against the rules and then B against the rules and then C against the rules, which is a little less efficient, it's better to take the first rule and apply it to all the answer choices and then the second rule and apply it to all the answer choices. It minimizes the amount of time that your eyes have to travel up and down or left to right as you're trying to come up, test the hypotheticals. So let's take the first rule and look for answer choices where T is not in front of W. Well, we can see that in B, W is in front of T, so we can eliminate that. We take the second rule, right? There has to be an R space M chunk, and we look for where that doesn't occur. Well, it doesn't occur in answer choice A, so we can eliminate a. If we look at the next rule that P and S must be consecutive, well, we can see that they're not consecutive in D, so we can eliminate D. And then for the last rule, if V is not third, then V must be fourth. Well, we see that V is not fourth in answer choice E, we can eliminate that, and that leaves us with answer choice C as the right answer. Let's try another question. Take a stab at this, and when you think you have the answer, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So this question is a little bit different. This is a local question. So they've given us a new piece of information in the question stem, and it's really important for us to take that piece of information and run with it as far as we can. The, the key to doing well on local questions is to follow the inference chain as far as you can from that new piece of information, but don't go any further than you know. So it's like you want to find everything that you do know, but don't fill in any of the holes. Don't plug in things that could be the case. Only plug in things that you absolutely know when you put S into the seventh position. If we put S into the seventh position, then we know that P must be in the sixth position. But it's hard to make any progress from here. It doesn't seem like anything else falls into place necessarily. And so while we can rule out answer choice E, we know that uh, T could not be sixth, we're going to have to test out the other answer choices. And so it might just be easier to kind of work our way backwards by putting T. If you look at T in the rules, right, there's a rule that says that T has to be in front of W. So if T has to be in front of W, then putting T into the fifth position is going to make it really hard to put D W behind it. So we can rule out answer choice D. If we pull T forward to the fourth position, then we would have to put W into the fifth position, which means that we'd have to put V into the third position, but then we have no room for R space M. So we'll break that second rule. We're going to rule out answer choice C. So let's try to bring T forward another position to the third position. Right, so now what we're doing, we started off by taking the, the local piece of information running as far as we could with it, using that to rule out any answer choices we could. And now we're kind of testing cases to see which one of the following could be the case. So third. If we put T third, then we have to put V fourth. But if we put V fourth, we have no place to put the R space M chunk. So we can rule out entry choice B. There's no way that T could go third. So that must be the case that T can go second, but let's just double check and make sure that that's possible. If we put T second, then we can't put R and M into three and five, because then that would require both V and W back there as well. Nobody would be left over for the first position. So we'd have to put the R space M chunk into one through three. And if we did that, we could put the V fourth and we could put the W fifth. And so we could totally make that work. And choice A is definitely possible. Let's try another question. Go ahead and see if you can find the right answer and then hit play again. All right. So here's another local question. We're going to take that same approach where we take that new piece of information, plug it into the game board, follow the inference chain as far as we can. In this case, instead of being a could be true at the end, it's a must be true. Right. So it's much more likely that the end of the inference chain is the idea that ends up being the right answer. 
if we put p fifth, then s has to either be fourth or sixth. So let's try putting it fourth to start. If we do that, then v would have to be third, but then there's nowhere to put the r space m block. So we can't put s fourth. Let's try putting s sixth. If we put s sixth, then we know that the r space m block it will be in positions one through four somewhere. Uh, we know that v will be in either positions three or four as well. We know that t has to precede w, so t is going to be in there as well. But that w is going to end up back in there in the seventh position. So this is what we know if p is fifth. Let's see what they give us what the answer choice is. Answer choice A says that the m is the fourth position. Doesn't look like it has to be true. The r is in the second position. Again, it doesn't look like it has to be true. Looks like we could put it in the first or the second position. So what we're looking for is something that we determined for sure. And really the only things we determined for sure were S was going to go sixth and that W was going to go seventh. So we might just kind of scan for either one of those. And we see that in answer choice C. Right, so that's the right answer. Answer choice D doesn't have to be true. Wait, T could be in the fourth position. Uh, v doesn't have to be in the third position. It could be in the fourth position. So we don't exactly know what's going to happen in front of the P, but we do know what's going to happen after the P. Here's the next question in the set. Give this one a try, and when you're ready to work this through together, hit play again. So this is a global question. It's asking for the one player that can't go third. Right? Each of the following could go third except, so we're looking for the one player who can't go third. And this would be a good place to check your, your previous work. Like We just had in our last uh, question uh, this hypothetical, and maybe in this hypothetical we can see that some of them could go third. So if we look at that um, little cloud above the positions one through four, it looks like maybe M or V or T could go third. What's interesting is that V isn't even an answer, so we don't even have to test that. But we should check out M and T. So if we put M into the third position, does anything else fall into place? Well, R would have to go first, V would have to go fourth, T would have to go second, and we satisfy all the rules, so we know that M could go third. So let's cross off answer choice A. Who else could go third? Well, we said that we don't have to check V, but let's check T. So if we put T into the third position, then we have to put R and M into two and four around it, but then V isn't going third or fourth, so this won't work. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can pick answer choice D. So the fact that we couldn't get T to go third in this hypothetical doesn't mean that T couldn't go third in another hypothetical. So let's just go to B. Plug it in, see if we can make it go third. If it can, cross it off. Eventually, we're going to get to one that we can't make go third, and then we will pick that answer choice. So if we put R third, then we have to put M5, which means we have to put V4, which means we could put P and S in 1 and 2, and T and W into 6 and 7. Of course, we could switch those. We could put T and W into 1 and 2 and P and S into 6 and 7. But this is going to work. So we know that R could go third. We can cross it off. If we want to check out answer choice C, which is S, we put S third, and then we have to put V fourth. R and M would have to slide into five through seven so that they could have a space between them. That means that P would have to go second so that it could be next to S, and T and W would slide into one and six respectively. But that works. S could go third. We can cross off answer choice C. Let's check out D. T. If we put T third, well, then V still has to go fourth. R and M are going to have to go five and seven respectively. And we're going to have to put the W somewhere after the T. So W have to slide into 6. That leaves P and S to go into 1 and 2. And that's totally fine. That works. So it must be E that doesn't go third. But let's find out why. If we put W third, then we have to put V fourth. R and M would have to go into 5 and 7 again. Now, we have to put the P and S consecutively in 1 and 2. We don't know which way they go. But that's going to force T into the 6th position after the W and break the first rule. So we know that... W um, cannot go third. Try the next question, and when you're ready to look at this together, hit play again. So this is a local question, and they're telling us that if the R and the M are between the T and the W, what could be the case? Well, if R and M are between T and W, one easy way to make that happen is to put the T and W into 1 and 7, respectively. And then we could just figure out where we put the R and M between them. So if we put the R and M in maybe 2 and 4 or maybe four and six. I guess we could try three and five, but if we put R and M into three and five, we wouldn't be able to separate or connect, sorry, keep together the P and S. 
So maybe we try four and six. If we put R and M into four and six, we put the V into three. But again, here you can't get the P and S consecutive, so R and M don't go into four and six. Maybe we try come back and try um, spots two and four. If we put R and M into two and four, then we're going to have to put P and S into five and six, which means that V would have to go into three. Here's a valid hypothetical where R and M are between T and W. So anything that's in this hypothetical, if it were to show up in the answer choices, would be the correct answer. And we get lucky. Answer choice A is something that we know could be true based off of uh, this hypothetical. If we look at the other answer choices, though, the S going second, well, we have R going second, so it doesn't look like we can get S going second. T going third, well, we have right now V going third, so that doesn't look good. The V going fourth, well, right now we have V going third, so that doesn't look good. And then W in the sixth position, right now we have it in the seventh position. So, well, we didn't absolutely prove that B through E are wrong because maybe it's possible that one of those could have happened in an alternative hypothetical. Because we already found a hypothetical that worked for answer choice A, that was enough to pick it. Try this question. It's the next one in the set. And then when you're ready to work it through together, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So another local question. We have a new piece of information. If there is exactly one painting between the T and the W, which one of the following must be true? So this is a little bit tougher than the last one because it's a must be true. Hopefully we get some inferences that follow on from the, the fact that T and W are going to be separated by one. But they're not telling us where to put the T and W, which does make this a little bit tricky. If we put the T and W into one and three, maybe we put to R and M into two and four, but that doesn't really leave room for V in either three or four. So that's not great. If we put R and M into four and six, we're not going to be able to get the P and S consecutive. If we put the R and M into five and seven, again, we're not going to get the P and S consecutive. So maybe we try the T and W slide over one position. Let's put them in two and four. If we do that, then V would have to go third. And in order to have the R and M separated by one, we'd have to put them into five and seven. But again, the P and S aren't consecutive, so that's not going to work. And maybe we slide over the T and W by one more position. So we put T and three and W and five. In that case, we're going to have to put V into four. But that doesn't leave us room to separate the R and the M by one space. So that's not going to work either. We keep shifting the T and the W back further. Let's try four and six. In this case, V would have to go third. In order to get P and S consecutive, they'd have to go into one and two. And that leaves R and M for five and seven. Now this works. So, so here's a valid hypothetical. Any answer choice that is not in this hypothetical doesn't have to be true. So we can use it as a counterexample. It doesn't mean that we can pick anything that is in the hypothetical, but it does mean that we can cross out anything that is not in the hypothetical. Okay, so entry choice A, the M is in the seventh position. We have that. Let's keep it. Entry choice B, P is in the first position. That could be the case, but it doesn't have to be the case here. It could be the case that P is second. So we can eliminate B. The R is in the fourth position. No, R could be in the fifth position according to this hypothetical. So let's get rid of C. Answer choice D. The T is in the second position. Nope, it could be in the fourth position. Let's get rid of D. E, the V is in the third position. Yep, that's true here. So let's hold on to A and E and see if we can come up with counterexamples to either of these. If we look at answer choice E, if we try to put V somewhere other than the third position, the only other place you could put it is in the fourth position. If we can make this work, we'll end up crossing off E and picking A. If we can't make this work, then it does have to be true that V is in the third position and we'll pick E. So if we put V into the fourth position, we could put R and M into the first and third positions respectively. T and W, because they're in, gonna be separated by one in this question, we could put them in positions five and six, but then we can't really connect or keep the P and S consecutive. So it doesn't look like V can go into the fourth position because we won't be able to put both the R and M block and the T and W block even in the game board. But let's take a look at A just to figure out if that's um, why that doesn't have to be the case. If we put M into the sixth position, we could put R into the fourth position. V would have to go third at that point. P and S would be consecutive in one and two. And T and W would slide into five and seven. Perfectly valid hypothetical. A does not have to be true. And so we can eliminate it, leaving us with E as the right answer. Here's the last question. Give this one a try, and when you're ready to talk it through together, hit play again. All right, welcome back. Again, another local question. So we have this new piece of information. If the Turner is next to the V yard, so if T is next to V, which one of the following is a pair of paintings in which the one mentioned first must be closer to the entrance than the one mentioned second? This is kind of tricky. So if the T is next to the V, what do we know? Well, 
If the T is going to be next to V, we could try putting V into the third position and putting T into the second position. That seems like it would be maybe easy enough. If we did that, maybe R and M could slide into four and six. But then how are we going to keep the P and S consecutive? Even if we slid R and M over to five and seven, we're not going to have P and S consecutive. So that's not going to work. Maybe we try putting V into the fourth position, putting T into the third position. Well, if we did that, then we could put R and M into five and seven. P and S would go into one and two and W would go into six. This is again a valid hypothetical. So they're asking for a pair of paintings in which the one mentioned first must be closer to the entrance than the one mentioned second. That means for every hypothetical, including this hypothetical. So if the pair is not organized in that manner, in this hypothetical, we can get rid of the answer choice. So for example, A doesn't have to be true, right? We could put um, the S before the P. The R before W, that does have to be true. Let's hold it. C, the T uh, before the V, that does have to be true. Hold it. D, the V uh, before the T, that does not have to be true. Get rid of it. And then E, the W before the R, that doesn't have to be true either. Let's get rid of E. That one hypothetical knocked out A, D, and E. And now we can go look at B and C to figure out if we can come up with a counterexample to either one of these. So the R and the W, well, if we move R, we end up having to move M and it gets a little bit messy. But if you look at entry choice C, T and V, it's possible we could just switch V and T without having to worry about everything else. In that case, it doesn't have to be the case that T is before V. We can get rid of C and B ends up being the right answer. R has to be before W. So now that we've taken a look at a real example, let's talk about some things that can come up in standard ordering games, generally speaking, and how you should deal with them. The first thing let's talk about is subgroups. Subgroups occurs in about 7% of standard ordering games. And subgroups is when they give us different kinds of players. So for example, let's say we have three students, F, G, and H, three parents, R, S, and T, and two teachers, Y, and Z, and they're going to be assigned to staff a concession stand each Saturday for the next eight weeks. Eight players, eight weeks, but we have different kinds of players this time. Some of them are students, some of them are parents, and some of them are teachers. So the way we deal with that is we create subgroups in our roster, in our list of elements. We have one area for students, one area for parents, one area for teachers. If we want to, we can use subscripts next to those players as we put them into the game board. But generally speaking, you don't need to. They generally keep the players apart from each other in alphabet, or you get used to working with the letters anyways. That It's not necessary to put in subscripts or use uppercase or lowercase letters, although you could if you're having a hard time keeping track of who's who. So now try notating these rules, and when you're ready to check your work, hit play again. Let's take on these rules one at a time. So the first rule tells us that F must be scheduled for some week before H, but F cannot be immediately before H. So we know that F is before H, and there's at least one between them. We also know that T is before S. And because of the third rule, that the number of spaces between the F and the H will be the same as the number of spaces between the T and the S. It's a little bit of a tricky rule to write, so I had to be a little bit creative here. If you came up with something different, it's probably perfectly fine. This is not a very common rule that you'll have to replicate again and again. If we go to the fourth rule, Z must immediately precede G, so we have a ZG block. And then the last rule says that the first week cannot be a student, so that means that F, G, and H cannot go first. At that point, we could look for inferences, but it doesn't look like there's a whole lot here. And then we get started with the questions. While subgroups isn't the most challenging set feature that you could throw at a logic game, it is something that brings the level of difficulty up a little bit. And so if you can think about adding on one layer after another of little things that can be a little bit more challenging, the accumulation effect of those is that the game can get pretty difficult. The next feature I want to talk about are games that have an uneven number of players to position. 25% of all standard ordering games have either more players in positions or more positions than players. And this is going to increase the difficulty quite a bit, actually. This is one of their go-tos when they want to make a standard ordering game more, more challenging. If you have more players than positions, right, this could work in a couple of different ways. One is that you have these seven players and five positions, and each player is going to be assigned to exactly one position, and each position is assigned at least one player. What does that mean? Well, it means that you're going to have five positions and seven players, Everybody's going to go somewhere, and you can't have any position empty. But to make this work, we're going to have to have some of those positions with more than one player. It'll have to be the case that maybe 
L and M or like one of those positions will have three players in it or maybe two of the positions will have two players each. Either way, there's going to be some variation in terms of how we can distribute the seven players into the five positions. And we want to keep track of those variations. These are called numerical distributions. And they're really helpful for helping you make quick inferences as you're working through a, uh, a question. So they, they sit off to the side and they just kind of serve as a reminder of what's possible numerically with the different um, players to positions. Right? What, either four of the positions will have one player and one position will have three players or three of the positions will have one player and two of the positions will have two. Alternatively, it could be the case that with your seven players in five positions, you have a rule that says that each position is assigned exactly one player, right? It's not the case that um, every player has to go somewhere, but it is going to be the case that each position is going to get exactly one player. In that case, some of the players will not go in the number line, right? We'll have five of the seven being ordered one through five, and the remaining two We'll just create an out area. And what this does is it creates a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of slots that are on your page and the number of players, right? Because we're basically keeping track now of the two that don't go into the number line. We're creating their own area, right? So we're either going to use numerical distributions to understand the variations that are possible with the numerical distributions, or we're going to try to create one-to-one -one correspondence by creating additional slots where we can track the remaining players. If we have fewer players than positions, well then, let's say we have four players, but five positions. If each element is assigned exactly one position, we're not going to be able to fill up all of those positions. One of them will be empty. We'll put a slash there. And essentially what we're doing is we're creating one-to-one -one correspondence, either by getting rid of one of the positions or by adding an extra character, however you want to look at it. Alternatively, we could have a situation where we have four players, five positions, but the rules say each position is assigned exactly one player. Now, every spot needs to get a player, but we don't have enough players. So some of the players are going to have to go more than once in order to make this happen. In this case, we're going to need numerical distributions again. Right? If some of them are going to have to go more than once, then which means that three of them will go once and one of them will go twice. So when we have non-one-to-one -one games, we're either going to be creating one-to-one -one correspondence by uh, creating an area for some players that are not going to be in the number line, or creating a slash in one of the positions that's not going to get a player. Or we'll be using numerical distributions to better understand what's possible. What's the, what, what are the different variations in, in numerical distributions that are possible? Finally, there's a strategy that you can use when approaching logic games that involves building frames. And this is a strategy that can be really powerful because it can enable you to move really quickly. It essentially allows you to track a bunch of hypotheticals within um, a very finite number of rows and allows you to kind of skim through the, your work and answer the questions really quickly. It doesn't always work, but about 18% of standard ordering games can be framed. So the mechanism that you want to use when trying to figure out whether frames are a good idea on standard ordering games or not is whether or not you see a block limited to two or three places in the game boards. Blocks are your friend. When that block is limited to just a couple of places on the game board, that's when you want to create a couple of different frames, a couple of different rows where you're tracking the different possibilities. Right? This needs to be a complete set of solutions or you can get into big trouble here. So you have to be really careful. So go ahead and take a look at this one. We have an athletic director going to schedule exactly six volunteers, L, M, N, O, P, and Q, to staff a concession stand for the next six weeks. The schedule must conform to the following conditions. So here are the rules. Go ahead and notate them. And when you've got them notated, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So let's go ahead and walk through them real quick together. If M is later than N, we know that N is before M. If Q is later than O, then O is before Q. And if O is exactly three weeks after L, then there will be an L, then two weeks, and then O will be on that third week following L. So there'll be two in between. And then according to that last rule, N is either going to be first or else third. We could clean up the rules just a little bit. We can take the second and third rules and link them together. And then we're ready for our inferences. See if you can take the block and run it out in its limited forms and follow any inferences that come as a result of that. All right, let's work this through together. So where can we put the LO block? We know we can put it in one and four, or at least it looks like we can looks like we can put it in two through five. 
But if we try to push it into 3 through 6, we wouldn't have room for the queue behind it. So there's really only two ways we can put that LO block. It'll have to either go 1 through 4 or 2 through 5, and that can be the foundation of our frames. We look to see if anything falls into place from there. So for example, if L goes into 1 and O goes into 4, we know that N has to go into 3. In the top row, we know that N is before M, so M will be in either 5 or 6. And we know that Q is after O, so Q will be in either 5 or 6, which means that M and Q are going to be back there in 5 and 6, leaving P for the second position. In the bottom row, if L is second and O is fifth, then, well, we don't really know whether N is going to go 1 or 3. So we could run it out both ways. In either case, the Q would have to go 6. In the middle row, that leaves M and P able to flip-flop back and forth. We don't know whether they're going to go third or fourth. And then in the bottom row, we know that N has to go before M, so M will go four, and that leaves P for the first position. So really, this game only has five total ways of doing the game. There are two hypotheticals in the top row, two hypotheticals in the middle row, and one hypothetical in the bottom row. It's a fairly limited uh, game, and it would be a really good idea to have those frames built ahead of time. So in summary, you spot a standard ordering game with language in the scenario and the rules. You're looking for rules and language that suggest that something is going to come before something else or earlier than something else, that the players will come in order or consecutively, that you'll be ranking them. And if you have a variable set that has an inherent order, it's a pretty good idea that you're going to want to use that as your base. The game board that you're going to want to use on a standard ordering game is a number line. So however many positions they give you, that's how many positions you want to have in your number line. The types of rules that you want to be ready for, rules that are relative in nature, meaning relating to uh, players, two or more players in a relative relationship. Fixed rules, rules that build a fixed relationship between two players, typically a block or a split block where there's a player in between or two players in between. Position rules deal with ruling out a player from a particular position. And conditional rules build if-then relationships that you have to be ready to apply when the trigger is true. You create frames on standard ordering games when you have a block limited to two or maybe three places in the game board. And that's it for standard ordering games. So I invite you to check out some of these other lessons or visit us today at lsatlab.com.